Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing today? We're getting close to the end of this quarter, spring 2020. Uh, today's lesson will be scheduled for Monday, the 15th of June. Okay. And again, I keep on asking the name of the school. Nobody's answered me yet. I hope it's International School of the East. If that's not your school, you shouldn't be here. Well, please leave the classroom. Do we know the name of the class? U.S. History through 1876, my birthday when I was born, 1876. That would make me over 120 something years old. But I look good, right? Okay. So, uh, like I said, today will be our last video recording lecture. Uh, the 22nd will be the final. So, is, uh, I'll check with the office, but as far as I know, uh, you'll just be sent to final because I, I can't give you new material. You have to study for it. So I think you're going to get lucky. And today is going to be the last time you listen to a uh, beautiful recording and lecture of material of U.S. history that hopefully uh, you can enjoy it, right? So we're going to wind up today with Abraham Lincoln and uh, the Civil War. Does anybody know what bill Abraham Lincoln is on? Is he on the $1 bill? Is he on the $20 bill? I mean, it's like Korean money. I, I know on the 50,000 won, they got that Ajima on there. So I, I know that one for sure. But uh, he's on the $5 bill. Yes. So um, anyway, I guess with, uh, without further ado, I shall start uh, with the lecture. Okay. And hopefully we can uh, get through it. Thank you. If I'm a little slow with the writing today, I have a, a hand injury on the left, so I have to do everything with one hand, so please bear with me, okay? All right, so let me go to the share screen and go to the lecture. I'm setting it up, put my face in the corner here, so away from you, so you can concentrate on the lesson. Even more, I'll try to hide myself. You can see, you can see I'm still uh, doing the lecture from Jejido. That's where I'm living now, Jejido, Korea, right? Because uh, we only have uh, maybe 12 cases of uh, COVID-19, so pretty safe for me here, right? Yeah, I'm living up in the Halasan Mountain with the bears. That's where I'm at. Okay, so again, HIS, school code 101, class title, United States history through 1876, and this is for June 15th, right? And if it's anybody's birthday today, happy birthday, All right? So let me proceed. All right, Make sure I match this up. Okay, the rise of Abraham. Lincoln, okay? The rise means as he went up in power. It doesn't mean that he got up off the bed. It means he was rising in power. First this low step and that low step, and on he went, okay? So it says, from backwoods origins, Abraham Lincoln held many jobs in his lifetime. Rail splitter, Ferry boat captain, store clerk, surveyor, and postmaster among them. But the job that solidified his place as a great figure in history was his role as the 16th president of the United States during a time of great strife. So there's a lot of tricky words here for you guys. So I'm gonna to have to do a good job here on the vocabulary introduction. Okay, we start with backwoods origin. Okay, so I know, I, do you know the word woods? That's a country name for forest, okay? So from backwoods origins means he, family was actually from the forest. They lived out there with a small population of other people. So you, there's one thing being a country boy, 
And there's another thing from being way out in the forest, and that's where he started. Um, so he held many jobs, a rail splitter. Okay, what that is, uh, before they make the railroad, they have to rake the railroad track. and He had to split with a big, it's not a, a hammer, <coughs> Uh, maybe some kind of mallet and you have to split the tie to stick it in there. Very tough job. Uh, ferry boat captain. Um, some cities have ferry boats and they go from like a land area to an island area. So he was a captain on a ferry boat. Store clerk, we all know that. Surveyor means that he studied the land and then probably gave a price on the land, they'd want to know. Um, I might want to buy this land area. How much is it? Can you survey it and let me know? So he did that. And then postmaster means he was in charge of the post office. And this is the job that solidified. Anything that solidified turns solid. So what made everybody remember him, his most important job, nobody remembers rail splitting and ferry boat captain. Um, what, and it, so what solidified his position as a great person in history was when he became the 16th president of the United States during a time of great strife. Strife is another word, it's a high level word for struggle. And struggle is a time when people are basically fighting to survive. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was born on February 12th, 1809. Sounds like a good question to ask you. When was Abraham Lincoln born? But guess what? I probably won't ask that question. Don't worry. I know you guys don't be, like to be attacked with uh, dates. In a log cabin, a log cabin is a house made from cut trees. So it's actually the trees, like log cabin syrup. In a log cabin that his father built in Kentucky, his youth was filled with hunting, fishing, and chores. Uh, chores is a country word for uh, things to do, right? Parents told them you have things to do. Like I had chores when I was a kid. I had to cut the front yard, the backyard, take out the trash, make my bed every day, uh, dry the dishes for my mom if she washed them. If she was too sick, I had to wash and dry the dishes, put them up, and other things that I had to do. So he had his chores. Because land titles were disputed in Kentucky, Abe's father moved the family to Pigeon Creek, Indiana, near Gentryville today, where the federal government was selling land. Two years after the family settled in this thriving frontier community, Abe's mother died in an epidemic caused by ingesting poisonous cow's milk. The next year, Abe's father uh, married a widow with three children, and Abe seemed to bond well with his stepmother. Okay, not so many vocab here, just a few. Um, thriving frontier, Any, anything thriving is really busy and really doing well financially. So you, you, you'll hear that sometimes. Maybe you know someone that has a restaurant, a cajodon, right? And uh, you say, hey, how's business here? How's it been since you opened? And they might say, if they're doing very, very well, it's thriving. You know, we're so busy during the week and the weekend is packed. And so that's thriving. So we already know epidemic since we've been caught up, all of us in the COVID-19 epidemic. It says caused by ingesting cow's milk. So I, I don't know why, sometimes people who write books, they wanna use really high level words. So they could have just said by drinking poisonous cow's milk, uh, which is, you know, he's, it, if you look at his life, I, I think later he had a brother that died. He had a blister on his big toe and it popped while he was wearing black socks and got an ink infection and died. So there's a couple of people that died very strangely in uh, Abraham Lincoln's life. And then it says at the bottom, Abe seemed, which is short for Abraham, 
Abe seemed to bond well with his stepmother. So bonding is when you spend time with someone and you realize you both like each other and you can become very close. So, and that's why mothers put their babies with the father or at least try. The father wants to go out and do other things. It's like, no, you have to bond with the baby so you can be close with the baby, okay? Now we have our first fun fact, okay? The practice of supporting the projects of other legislators in return for their support became known as log rolling, a term derived from a game of skill, especially among lumberjacks, in which two competitors try to balance on a floating log while spinning it with their feet, okay? And that still happens to this day in politics. The legislators are the people who make laws. So um, I'll just, I'll tell you what they do today. So it's the same thing. Uh, let's say I'm a legislator and uh, who's in my class here? Uh, Temujin, Temujin's a legislator. So I will support now, who knows if I even believe in what he says, but I support, you know, his project and hoping that later when I try to get mine, he will support me. So, you know, that's what they call that. Okay. And it goes on here too, kind of like you want to get, move up in the political thing where well, you better support some other people, even if you don't really believe in what they're saying. So not a good uh, policy, kind of, as they say, uh, Apple polishing, right? Okay, so let me look on the bottom. I have to make sure I match up um, where I'm at. So let me just get there. Okay, Abe learned at a young age to wield an ax and to clear the frontier forest. And he attended a log cabin school where he was intending to chores. So again, there's that log cabin. He also made a school out of it. So tending to chores means he wasn't doing, like I told you, he wasn't cutting grass or chopping wood or doing anything. He just went to school. In later years, his campaign hearkened back to these rail splitter days to prove that Abe came from humble roots. And this is very important in his popularity. America traditionally has always loved people that came from humble, poor roots, okay? So when it says hearken back, it, 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 it made people remember. That's what that term means. So again, these rail splitter, when he was making the ties for the railroad, and it proved that he came from humble roots. Uh, in traditional American culture, if you come from a rich background and are spoiled, people are suspicious of you. That you don't really know what the poor people or regular people have to go through or suffer. So, but this proved he came from humble roots and helped people vote for him because they liked that. They thought they could trust him. It says, though the lad had less than one year of formal education, his stepmother encouraged his thirst for knowledge. Lincoln learned to read, write, and do simple arithmetic at an early age. And it's said that a book about George Washington made a deep impression on him. With his family's move to Illinois, Abe helped his father build a log cabin that year he, okay, so I'll stop there. Uh, wield an ax, you know what an ax is, it's a long stick and it's got a sharp blade on one end. And usually people use it to cut down trees. That's an ax, and that you, you have to cut down trees to make a log cabin. The lad, lad is an old term meaning uh, young boy. And I think they still use it in Britain. Here we don't use that anymore. Okay, and encourage, his stepmother encouraged his thirst for knowledge. So they say when people are hungry to learn, 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 they have either a hunger or a thirst for knowledge. She encouraged him. And this is the book about George Washington made a deep impression on him, which means really, really touched his heart and made such an impression on him. Okay. And as you see again, Abe helped his father build a log cabin. So 
where he was from in that area, not the Southwest, right? Where it's desert, you don't have a lot of trees in most areas. Uh, here they did, so they built log cabins. So at this time, it's time for me to uh, mark off that we finished the first page. Okay, my pen doesn't want to write now, how nice. I get these pens sometime. I think, uh, how much you gave me that pen? Okay, so uh, let me go to, The whiteboard. You think I'm gonna get the pencil? You think I'm gonna be kind today and only go two questions like I did most of last week? Should I, since we're almost done? Maybe I should just be mean. So again, remember, I'm only using one hand, so I'm a little slow here. Okay, sorry about that. Maybe I'll be kind. Oops. Sorry, see it went all caps there. Bad computing. It's got a, oh, now the pencil disappeared. Somebody stole my pencil. Maybe that was Tall, Tall stole my pencil. Or no, Inky, I think it's Inky, she's got fast hands. All models have fast hands. Hey, oh, that, if you heard that sound, that, uh, that was a rhinoceros. We have a rhinoceros up here in uh, Halasan. Uh, name some jobs that Lincoln had before becoming president. So was, what are, did he work at McDonald's? Uh, was he a male stripper? What, what job, name some jobs that he had before he became president, okay? So for my Korean students to say, what is a rhinoceros? We don't know. It's a kopulso, okay? So that's the sound you heard. I don't know how to say rhinoceros in Chinese or Mongolian. I have to wait for, uh, maybe Ken would teach me how to say it in uh, Mongolian, rhinoceros. You know, the big heavy animal with the big horn on the front? Yeah. <laughs> so again, Name some jobs that Lincoln had before becoming president. And you know what? I will be kind. I'll only give you two here. Wasn't a lot of reading material there. Where's my pencil? Ah, Tamujin, constantly stealing my pencil. Okay, two. Okay, two, how much formal education did he have? Okay, was he a college graduate? Did he go to Yale? Did he go to Harvard? Did he go to Yonsei University or Waseda in Japan? How much formal education did he have? I'll give you a hint. For a short time, he was a student at University of the East. It's just to let you know. Okay. So I'll give you a few minutes there to write those down. So Titan doesn't get angry after she gets off the candy crush. He says I didn't give her enough time to write the questions down. Go ahead, Titan. 
And Caroline, too, her assistant. The unpaid assistant, Caroline. Done on that right now? Okay, good deal. Uh, let me go to the eraser. Where is that eraser? Yeah, Temujin never steals the eraser, only the pencil. Okay, so one, name some jobs that Lincoln had before becoming president. I think there were at least three. The more you write, the more you get points. Two, how much formal education did he have? Let us know about that. Did he go to a Sky University in Korea? All right, so I gotta go back to the delicious uh, reading. Okay, so we ended up here that he, so I must continue. More, okay. All right. Okay, that he attended a political rally and spoke on behalf of one of the candidates. You might say the political bug bit Lincoln. Okay. And he never quite recovered. So when you speak on behalf of people, you speak for them. You say, this guy's great. You know, like I hope you, you guys would do it. You say, oh, Teacher Barry, he's fantastic. I, I love him. I know you won't, but I'm hoping you speak on my behalf. And then it says, uh, you might say that the political bug bit Lincoln. Uh, American culture, we use that kind of slang a lot about bugs. So political bug bit Lincoln, and then he never quite recovered, which means once it bit him, instead of poison, it gave him a desire to be in politics. We also use that with the term love bug. So. We might have a friend that starts dating someone, right? And uh, because of her natural beauty, which could be any of my ladies in class here, you know, again, Inky, Munkbayar, I don't know, Munkbayar gives me a lot of trouble. Uh, Titan, uh, Caroline, whoever, and the guy quickly falls in love with her, then, it, it, you know, the love bug bit him. So, yeah, careful, they, ladies have love bugs. Okay, at a lanky six foot four, Lincoln's appearance was somewhat awkward, especially given his long arms and big hands. He held various jobs, but because he could read and write, he was called on to draw up legal papers for the less literate around him. And when Lincoln expressed his views, he did so with a grace and discernment that caught people's attention. Okay, attention. So, uh, Harris Langter called Lanky at six foot four. Lanky is the meaning that he was very skinny. And he kind of moved like this. And people say, well, that guy's lanky. And his appearance was somewhat awkward. I guess a really, really tall guy for the times and skinny and long arms. So doesn't look like your normal guy. Uh, so because he could read and write, he was called on to draw legal papers for the less literate. So if you cannot read or write, we call you an e illiterate person. So there was various stages of literacy there. People were more bound to work and try to survive. They didn't have the luxury of going to school. So a lot of people could not read or write or just a little, right? So because he could, they, hey, you're the guy to do these papers. Okay, and then when he expressed his views, he did so with a grace, so we know grace, like a ballet dancer. Or grace, my Chinese student, she's kind of violent. And then discernment that caught people's attention. So. When you have discernment, it means you can really decide between two things. You're not just 
confused. I don't know, maybe this one, maybe that one. I don't know. You know, so when you show that you have discernment, it uh, it grabs people's attention. You know, I'm, I mean, I can make it silly for you, you know. Let's say uh, you ask some guy, hey, which hamburger do you like better? You know, uh, McDonald's or In-N-Out? And everybody knows like 90 something percent of the people are gonna say In-N-Out. So you ask the guy and the guy says, well, I don't know, they're both hamburgers, so aren't they similar? I can't really tell the difference. So this fellow does not really have a discernment. The freshness and high quality meat and uh, other things that In-N-Out uses compared to McDonald's and food that, you know, burgers that taste kind of plasticky and are some kind held under a red light and not so fresh. So the sermon is not there, right? So now we get to the important stuff here. Lincoln enters politics. In the spring of 1832, <coughs> anybody alive in 1832? I wasn't, but close after. Lincoln decided to run for a seat in the Illinois House of Representatives. See, I sound like a person from California, Illinois, but probably back there, they'll say Illinois, but nobody argues about the correct uh, pronunciation. Remember, you got Busan and Busan, Beijing and Peking. Uh, before the election, he volunteered in the suppression of a rebellion by Native Americans led by Chief Black Hawk, though he saw no actual fighting. Despite a platform of better schools, roads, and canals, Lincoln was defeated and began a venture with the general store, followed by his job as a postmaster, a position that gave him ample time to read ravenously, especially newspapers. Okay, so any vocab thing up here? Okay, when you uh, try to suppress something, it means you try to stop it. So he tried to stop this rebellion, even though he saw no actual fighting. And you might see this try to be used in a high level word for your cough medicine. You just want to stop the cough, right? And they'll say, this cough medicine suppresses coughs. You know? All that means is that it stops the coughs. And then despite a platform or better school, so that just means the platform means what he was, uh, what his chapter, what his uh, belief was, I want better schools roads, he was still defeated. And then he began a venture, which is means a business with a general store. And it says, gave him ample time to read. Ample time means a lot of time. So uh, it's just like some people, you get sick and you go into the hospital. You're in the hospital bed for a few weeks. You're not working or exercising or going shopping. So it gives you ample time to read or watch TV or hunt the nurse or, or whatever you need to do at the time. But that, that's uh, Mr. Hall. Uh, then he says to read ravenously. So ravenously is like, gah, 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 gah. like they say animals eat ravenously, like the bear eats the deer ravenously yeah, yeah, because he's so, so hungry. He hasn't eaten in four days, right? He's been hunting for four days. So he read ravenously. So he read everything, especially uh, newspapers. Yeah. Now better known, Lincoln ran for the Illinois legislature in 1834. He was elected every two years and he studied law between legislative sessions. This experience as a state legislator sharpened his political savvy. Lincoln's first public stand on slavery, which he'd encountered years earlier when he viewed a slave auction, came in 1837 when the Illinois legislator voted to condemn abolition societies that wanted to end the practice by any means. Although Lincoln was opposed to slavery, he also felt strongly that extreme measures were not necessary and that lawful conduct could end the practice. So there's a couple of uh, confusing words there. Okay. 
It said he sharpened his political savvy. Uh, so any type of skill that you have, and they say you're getting better and better at it, people will say you're sharpening your skill, like if you sharpened a pencil. Right? And then savvy is a slang word for kind of like knowledge and experience. So it's a combination of both. So it's just like you, you might be the, the greatest guy in the police academy, but when you come out, you haven't worked before the streets and your experienced partner might say, you do not have any street savvy. You're gonna to have to acquire it quickly. Lincoln's first public stand on slavery, which he was a slave, okay. He wanted to condemn abolition, or the Illinois legislator wanted to condemn abolition societies. Abolition societies were uh, groups of Caucasian people, white people, that they said, hey, we want to end this slavery by any means. So, okay, that's that. So we're coming at the bottom here. Though Lincoln became a licensed lawyer in 1836 and continued as a state legislator, economic achievement didn't automatically follow. He also spent his time without love. Oh, it sounds like my life, without love. But I do have kimchi because I've been teaching in Cape Town for a long time. Uh, some said he was plunged into sadness by the death of Anne Rutledge, the woman he loved. And that a period of melancholy marked his adult years. Others believe this romance was a myth, so maybe not even true, right? I mean, like me too, if I have had any past girlfriends, they're all a myth, they didn't exist, only in my mind. Uh, he proposed marriage to another woman who, I hope it wasn't Inky, because Inky likes to say no. Um, so on the bottom, uh, even though he was a high-ranking state legislator, economic achievement didn't automatically follow, which means he didn't make a lot of money. Simple English. We already know spending time without love. I don't want to talk about it. I might cry. Um, some said he was plunged into sadness, plunges like a, a dive off of a mountain into the ocean. So whew, by the death of Anne Rutledge, a woman he loved. Melancholy is another word for sadness. He had a period of melancholy during his adult years after the death of Anne. Others believe this romance was a myth. So we know myth, myth is a story. Every country has its myths. Usually it's something you cannot prove. You know, it's, it, it happened too long ago. So you can say something was a myth if nobody has proof. I think Korea's myth is that the first Korean people were actually bears. So. Is that, can that be proven? Well, how many thousand years do Korean people go back on Korea? So it would be very, very uh, hard to prove. I'll have to ask the bears I'm living with up here in Jejuco. They'll, they'll probably know. Okay, so uh, I've got uh, two more questions here for you on this page. Okay. Whiteboard, pencil. Okay, let me mark down that we finished that page. We're moving along at a steady pace. These pens, I picked them up and they don't want to write. They're, they're fighting me, making trouble, trouble for me. Okie dokie. Question three. Again, I'm only using one arm. I'm Satoichi, the one arm samurai. Hey, which political office did he run for in 1834? Now, of course, I'm going to get a funny guy like Weissian or Temujin 
or Zhang Piel, or maybe even Purebi. Uh, teacher, what are you talking about? Who's he? We have no idea. I haven't changed talking about Lincoln. It's all about Lincoln. So I want to write his name every time. Lincoln, Lincoln, Lincoln. So which political office did he run for? Did he run for the mayor of Los Angeles? The governor? Right. What office did he run for? Okay, so again, I guess I'll stay kind and only write two for each page. Hey, easy as pie question. What did he become in 1836? Now, I've had funny guys like Temu Jim before, Jung Peel, they don't study, they don't pay attention, and then they write on the test, what did he become in 1836? And they'll write something like, he became pregnant. <laughs> so that's not the question I'm, or answer I'm looking for. So. Uh, it's connected to three, so four is connected to three. So uh, I'll give you a few minutes on that. Let me make sure that I write down that we completed that. And I hope everybody's staying safe and healthy. Careful, there's a lot of speeders out there. Please don't be one of them. Pretty, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, we got those tightened. We're okay. All right, go to the eraser. Which political office did he run for in 1834? What did he become in 1836? Oh, by the way, so he, bleh, since I'm living in Jeju, though, as you can tell, see? I found out that your honey there, one of the BTS guys, he has a cafe in Jeju, and I go there every week just to let you know. Hopefully you don't get jealous, okay, but he has a cafe there. Okay, back to the delicious, Okay, All right, so we were going through there. I stopped when he proposed, doo, doo, doo. okay. See, I told you it was inky. She turned him down after he proposed, right? And it wasn't until he met Mary Tall in 1840 that courtship blossomed and the two were married two years later. See, Tall is kind, she will say yes even though I don't know what she was doing in 1840. So I said courtship blossom. So the romance blossom like a flower. <sighs> Okie dokie. So Lincoln family life. Abraham and Mary Todd Lincoln had four children, but only their eldest son, Robert Todd Lincoln, would survive to adulthood. It said that Mary Todd Lincoln made her husband's life miserable. Oh, no for she was unable to handle the loss of their children in later years. And I guess it hurt her too deeply. Though she was perhaps unstable, which means mentally not strong, uh, Lincoln remained devoted to her and she in turn supported his political rise. So uh, I think we know the term miserable early, which means it's beyond, like you'd say it's very unenjoyable, but it's beyond that. It's like miserable, it's like painful. But he remained devoted to her, which means he loved her and stood by her side, didn't divorce her, didn't have an affair with Britney Spears. Um, so as we continue. Okay. Um, the ambitious legislator and uh, lawyers soon looked beyond Illinois 
to the U.S. Congress. And he was elected in 1846 to the House of Representatives. Despite the difficulties of being a freshman congressman, Lincoln never lost confidence in his abilities. He opposed the Mexican-American War by President Polk, though his Illinois constituents denounced him as a traitor, for they supported the war, that's why. In 1847, he called on Polk for proof of the president's insistence that the war began when Mexicans shed American blood on American soil. So, uh, going back to some vocab cleanup here, ambitious means someone who has a very, very high goal or goals. So he had very high goals as a legislator. That's why he looked beyond Illinois. He wanted to work in the U.S. Congress. Um, so we know opposed constituents means the people that you work with. So he opposed it, the Mexican-American War. So his Illinois constituents denounced him as a traitor, which means they actually put him down and said, he is a traitor. Well, a traitor is a person who's against your own country. So as I continue reading, uh, began with Mexicans shed American blood on American soil. According to Lincoln, that soil was not ours. And Congress did not annex or attempt to annex it. Lincoln voted for a resolution that declared the war unnecessary. Once war was declared, however, Lincoln supported all appropriations despite his private opinions. Lincoln resumed his law practice after serving one term in Congress. Travel between county seats allowed him to reflect, which means to think deeply, read and mingle with other lawyers. And mingle means to, that's an early term for like networking, go around, talk to them, make connections. Though he sometimes lacked or did not have enough time to prepare for cases, he made it up or he made up for it with oratory or speaking skill far greater than many of his peers or uh, again, uh, co-workers, constituents, okay? And now we get deeper into what he's known famous for, uh, Lincoln's anti-slavery sentiments grew or grow. Lincoln was outraged by the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854, a measure that allowed the territories to decide the issue of slavery for themselves. Democratic Senator Stephen Douglas was the author of the act and Abe Lincoln's passion for the plight or the trouble of the slaves grows to and the outrage means more than angry. Okay. Okay. When Douglas defended the Kansas Nebraska Act in October of that year, Lincoln spoke the next day, attacking the act with well-researched documents that force citizens to contemplate or think not only the political ramifications of slavery, but also the moral ones. Lincoln was quoted as saying, if the Negro is a man, why then my ancient faith teaches me that all men are created equal? and that there can be no moral right in connection with one man's making a slave of another. As impassioned as his conviction was that slavery was wrong and a national problem to contend with, Lincoln remained fairly non-judgmental regarding the South. I will not undertake to judge our brethren or brothers of the South. Lincoln said in what became known as his Peoria, Illinois speech. So I guess he's saying he was outraged and hated slavery, but he was not about to pick on or put down the South. Like, you know how I stand about slavery, but I don't have to sit here and say, you know, you're stupid, you're racist, you're evil. Just know how I stand on this. 
that's the way it was at the time. A lot of people had more, not compassion, but I mean, maybe a little compassion, but it's more of like, I don't have to go crazy and do all these things, but know that I'm very upset about this. Okay, so uh, back to uh, marking here. And question time, going back to the whiteboard. Pencil before Pridivy can steal it. Okay. Okay, which for war did he vote to make unnecessary? So again, Tem Temujin or Ken, I'm talking about Lincoln, haven't changed. This is all a Lincoln party. So which war did he vote to make unnecessary? Was it World War I? Was it World War II? Was it the Korean War? Because I think Lincoln fought in the Korean War. He, he arm wrestled Kim Il Sung, the DMZ. So, which word did he vote to make unnecessary? Okay. Let me get that pencil again. Pencil, pencil, okay. So, Remember, I'm slow because of my injury, so please be patient. If not, I'll call the police. Okay. Still staying with only two here. How kind I am. If you want to make a contribution to me, I'll, I'll let you know later where you can send it, uh, Western Union. So, uh, oops, I did a little, this didn't quite come out right. Let me fix this spelling. Okay, national, right? So again, which war did he vote to make unnecessary? And then the second one, what did he consider wrong and a national problem? That we had too many McDonald's or Starbucks and he wanted to fix that. So what did he consider wrong in society and a national problem? Let me make sure I've written this off. Like I said, we're moving at a steady pace. So I'll give you a few minutes on those. Write them down, Titan and Caroline. And Ken, Kenny Pooh. Oh, that's so just good. Because oh. I'm in inside Halasan Mountain. Okay. Mm. Okay. We finish. Kenjana. Okay. All right. We go to the eraser. Or Mr. Hong tries to take it. Again, which war did he vote to make unnecessary? Was it World War I, World War II, or the Korean War? Fix, what did he consider wrong? A national problem. Bingo bongo. Okay. So let me go back to the lecture. 
Okay, so I've gone down to the bottom of there. I'm gonna have to move over a bit because I think I'm done talking about Lincoln. So no more he's. We're gonna go on to the Civil War. Uh, it's the Civil War. Conflicts among the states worsened with each new state admitted to the Union. And the issue of slavery was a paramount concern. So anything paramount is really, really important, right? So again, I'll give you silly, extreme examples. You have a, a married couple and um, the husband's socks, they stink, okay? Now, even though it's hard for the wife to survive the smell of his socks, that problem is not paramount. The paramount problem that they have in their uh, relationship is that he's an alcoholic, okay? That's what's going to end the relationship. If he does not fix that, that is of paramount importance. I don't know, I've yet to meet a couple where the woman divorced her husband. She said, I loved him, but his socks smelled bad. But I have heard of women divorcing men that would not stop being alcoholics. As tensions rose or stress rose between the North and the South, citizens could no longer deny the imminent outbreak of war. So. Imminent means it's going to start soon. You don't know when exactly, but it is imminent. It is soon. An outbreak means the start of war. With the, so as their new president, Abraham Lincoln took office. So what a stressful time to become a president. Nervous time. As the southern states seceded. So what that means is not succeeded. You always have to continue to suck seeds until you succeed. That's how you can tell the difference. Uh, seceded means they just took away belonging to the United States. They said, we no longer belong to the United States. We secede. We're going to make our own union. And um, there was a movement for California to do that a number of years ago because of how much money we made and how successful we were. And they thought, we can just be our own country, the California. But then the recession happened when we had the governor, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. So those plans went out the window. We almost went into bankruptcy. As the Southern states seceded, the Confederates seized most of the federal forts within their borders. Only four remained under Union control. Fort Sumter, which was in Charleston, South Carolina, Fort Jefferson, Fort Pickens, and Fort Temujin. I mean, Fort Taylor, all in Florida. I guess we had one in Mongolia somehow. I, I don't know. Okay. So now, what this creates is the creation of the Confederacy. Following South Carolina's secession, again, separating themselves from the United States, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Shanghai, and Texas adopted similar ordinances or rules. The seceding states sent representatives to a convention in Montgomery, Alabama, where they adopted a provisional, which kind of like a temporary constitution gave themselves a name and chose a president of their own. Wow. Jefferson Davis of Mississippi was named president of the Confederacy. That's a name they gave themselves, Confederate States. And the delegates ratified or certified their separate constitution. Thus, the Confederate States of America, known as the Confederacy, was born. So here's some uh, dates that go along with the countries, which you uh, don't have to know, but uh, I'll just go through them for you for, you know, your knowledge. Don't worry. Um, so 
in starting South Carolina. Seceded, we're only going, it's not the readmission. Okay, so seceded in December 20th, 1860. Then Mississippi, January 9th, 1861. Florida, January 10th, 1861. Alabama, January 11th, 1861. Georgia, January 19th, 1861. Uh, Louisiana. January 26, 1861. Texas, everything's big in Texas. February 1st, 1861. Virginia, April 17th, 1861. Arkansas, where the Clintons are from. May 6th, 1861. North Carolina, May 20th, 1861. Um, and Tennessee, June 8th, 1861. And then ending off on this page, uh, Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy. That might be a good question for the final. It's a hint for, for John Watt, into, into. Uh, Jefferson Davis was born on June 3rd, 1808 in Kentucky. He was educated at Transylvania. Oh my gosh, I didn't, I thought that was in Romania. Transylvania University in Lexington, Kentucky, and at the U.S. Military Academy. He served on the frontier following graduation until his health forced him to leave the army in 1835. From then on, Davis was a planter in Mississippi until he was elected to the U.S. Congress in 1845. When the Mexican War broke out a year later, he, so uh, this list started on the prior page. So tell you what, because it's a mostly a list with some reading, I only have one question for you. One, how kind is that? Remember, keep the donations coming. All right, multiply out. Go back to the whiteboard. I'll have one difficult. Let me get that pencil. Question for you. Guess what? It's a number question. My students love these. One question for all that stuff. How many states seceded from the Union? So I didn't ask you name all the states. So you'd go crazy. That's like asking me to name all the states in Mongolia. All I know is Ulaanbaatar. Maybe Temujin town. Uh, Purvey city. So um, no names. Just give me the number of how many states seceded or took themselves away from the United States. So. Give you some time on that. Let me mark off what we've done. Put us closer to the end. I think we got three more pages. That's it. We'll be done. Okay. How many states are in the Philippines? I mean, you can't count islands. If you count islands, I think there's more than a thousand. I don't know. Okay. Uh, let me go to the eraser. Go here, it's gone. And uh, back to the delicious lecture. All right, so we went to the bottom of here. Where are we? Don't worry, people are getting excited. I think that was the, the couple saw again up here in the mountain. Okay. So we're still continuing for the Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy. So he resigned his seat to serve fighting at Monterey 
in Buena Vista. Following the war, Davis served as a U.S. Senator from Mississippi, as Secretary of War for President Franklin Pierce, and again as U.S. Senator from 1857 to 1861. As you might guess, his legislative voice was heard arguing in support of states' rights, and he used his influence during the Pierce administration to pass the Kansas-Nebraska Act favoring a pro-slavery sentiment. I guess that's because he was from the South and was used to that. Ironically, Davis didn't favor secession. Wow. As a Senator, he tried to keep the Southern states in the Union. Although when his own state of Mississippi seceded, he gave up his Senate seat. Okay, now we're gonna get into some uh, juicy material here. Preparing for war. After selecting cabinet members that represented other Southern states, Davis turned his attention to the necessary preparations for the impending conflict with the North Union. So impending is just like imminent, it's coming. It's not gonna be stopped, but you don't know exactly, but it's soon. Confederates had already seized or taken control of 11 federal forts and arsenals, arsenals are areas that have weapons uh, in the South, and they had caused trouble at Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. Shortly after he took office, President Lincoln sent reinforcements to Fort Sumter. Within weeks, 11 Southern states had broken away. Oops, that's an answer to one of the questions, last one. Leaving a handful of border states south of the Mason-Dixon line, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri that stayed with the Union, although some citizens joined the Confederate cause, so they kind of like crossed the line and went over there. Who knows, that might have been done due to family. If I had found that lived across the line and they wanted to support them, even though the Civil War is famous for brothers fighting brothers. You know, one lived on the North, one lived in the South, and they fought each other, so very sad. Um, going to the middle, towards the bottom, on May 24th, 1861, the Confederates moved their capital from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. When created, the Confederacy had a population of almost 9 million, including nearly 4 million slaves. But that paled by comparison. So means that, that 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 was weak numbers compared to the Union population, see, of approximately 22 million, so 13 million more. Weak numbers. Land values were higher in the North, as was economic strait, making the South extremely dependent on Europe for material items. So that's who was backing them at the time, different European countries. A basic lack of resources forced the Confederacy to levy or bring taxes and deal with rising inflation. So inflation is where things cost much more than what they're valued. We kind of have an inflation here with gas. I remember gas being under a dollar. It gets over four sometimes and it maybe drops to 380. So it's very, very high. There's inflation. Southern railroads proved to be inadequate or not enough. And the South also lacked the manufacturing equipment to make large field guns and even basic military equipment. After his election as president of the Confederate States of America, okay, that's a good place to stop at the bottom of this page. Let me mark off that we needed it which will leave us with only two more pages to go. Yay! So let me go back to the a white board. Okay. Let me, gotta, I gotta get that pencil before Tim which steals and it goes to Starbucks. Okay. First question.
Okay. These southern states became known as what? What did they become known as? AFC? Popeye's chicken? What did they become known as? Right? Okay. Next question. I go, where's my Benzo? Okay. Hold on, I'm only staying. You got like I was so kind. I gave you one. I'm only going back to two. Not even three. I used to ask three each page. Oh, I'm getting weak, I'm getting inadequate. Being too kind. Okay, on May 24th, 1861, what was their total population? So again, before I get my smart aleck, he's doing, whoa, who's they? What are you talking about? What do you mean they? It's connected, as you can see, Southern states to there. So hasn't changed. So the Southern states, what was their total population? Uh, so Mr. Hong, please don't, get confused and later give me the population for Poang, South Korea. Okay, I want the population. On May 24th, 1861 for the Southern states of uh, United States. So let me give you a couple minutes there. Mark down that we finished this page. Like I said, we'll be going on to our last two. Unless you want me to add three more, which I can do very easily. One more hour, go on. Because it's kind of boring up here in Halasan with the bears. We don't do too much. We just look for honey. That's all we do. Okay. Did you finish that, Titan? Yes. Okay. All right. Eraser time. Okay. Again, these southern states became known as what? KFC, Popeyes or Pollo Loco, okay. Nine, on May 24th, 1861, what was their total population? Meaning the Southern states, not the population of Gifu, Japan, okay. Thank you. Back to the lecture. Okay, so um, we went down to the Confederate States of America so I'll have to continue. All right. Davis failed to raise the much needed war chest to pay for the Confederate fighting. He was equally unable to interest foreign governments in helping the Confederate cause. Ooh. So when it says um, war chest, that's the big, you know, secret amount of money that governments have to pay for their war fighting for supplies and different things. He was not able to get that from the citizens or at least not enough. And then he, I guess foreign governments, meaning the European governments, started losing interest in trying to help the Confederates cause. Maybe they thought, you know, hey, you guys are in the United States. We, you know, we really don't care. So you deal with that yourself, right? I mean, really, what was in it for a European country or countries? Or well, what was the South, even if they won, what were they going to give them? I, I don't know. You know, I don't think they're going to say, hey, France, help us out, and then we'll give you two states for free. And that wasn't the case. So continuing, um, the Confederate government was in a state of constant turmoil. For turmoil, is like, you know, they can say the ocean is in turmoil during a storm, so up and down and up and down. So 
the Confederate government was in a state of ups and turmoil, like a storm, an ocean storm. It seemed with judges from the various state courts interfering in military matters. However, Davis did appoint General Robert E. Lee as commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. And Davis remained true to his task or job until the bitter end. He staunchly, which means very strong, not starching your pants, right? He staunchly believed that the South could achieve independence until he realized that defeat was imminent. So there's that word imminent again. So he realized we're gonna lose very soon. He fled or ran away, escaped the Confederate capital of Richmond. And on May 10th, 1865, federal troops captured him in Georgia. For two years, he was imprisoned at Fortress Monroe in Virginia. He was indicted for treason. Treason is when you go against your country or betray it. So like when uh, fellows try to escape North Korea and they're caught, they're usually killed for treason in North Korea. But released one year later on bond. Wow, he got released a year later. The federal government dropped its case against Davis in 1868. He lived many years engaged in a string of unsuccessful business ventures though he did write The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government, published in 1881. Davis died in 1889 and is buried in Richmond. So I've kind of explained those vocabs, so I don't have to go over that. But let's get on to the more important. Fire on Fort Sumter. As moderate as Lincoln tried to be, in his policy, so moderate is like in between. There was no fence sitting when the Confederate rebels fired on Fort Sumter in South Carolina in April, 1861. He had to act swiftly. Fort Sumter, which lay, or which means which was positioned at the entrance to the Charleston Harbor, remained under the command of Major Robert Anderson and a small detachment of federal troops. It was by far the most important of the four forts remaining under Union control. Okay. Uh, then this will start the fun fact, which I'll have to continue, but I'll stop here for the questions. Uh, who was the little lady who started the Civil War? Harriet Beecher Stowe, you don't have to know this, but it's cute, was an American writer and an abolitionist, again, a person, uh, a Caucasian person against slavery, who wrote a powerful novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, that precip precipitated or came before. So let me stop there. I've got a couple of questions here, in the last reading. So back to the white Bordeaux. And so, okay. Okay, who led the Confederate Army? Who was in charge of the army? Right. Was it Donald Trump? Was it King Sejong? Who was it General George Patton? Who was in charge, or maybe John F. Kennedy, of the Confederate Army? So let me know what the name of the famous general was. Is my pencil still working? Yay. Again, I'm only staying with two. I'm gonna to be too kind on the last one. No, no three questions here.
easiest pie questions. Okay, how did the Civil War start? How did it start? Did they vote and say, hey, we want to start on this day? Did they flip a coin and say heads or tails? Or they went to a fortune teller and asked the fortune teller when to start the war? So please let me know uh, how did it start? And let me mark off this page. And I think we only have one more after this. We can wrap it up. And then next week, uh, you know, take the test. Let me mark off, we've done these. And yes, definitely, we only have one more page, or as they say in Spanish, pagina. Okay. So you wrote these down. These are pretty easy. You ready, Titan? Caroline, can the gang of three, okay, eraser, who led the Confederate Army. Uh, again, I've had guys like Purvey or Temujin write down, oh, it's from the South, right? It was Colonel Sanders. Like, no, sorry, not uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Harabuchi, sorry. 11, how did the Civil War start? Okay, there you go. All right, you ready for your last page? Page poo. So let me go to lecture. Okay, so like I said, we read about a little bit about Harriet Beecher here. That's our last fun fact for this uh, chapter. Okay. Uh, Civil War will strengthen the anti slavery movement. Legend has it that when President Lincoln Met Harriet Beecher Stowe, he said, so you're the little lady who started the Civil War. All right, so that's our last fun fact. <coughs> Actually, for this quarter. Reluctantly, because he feared igniting, igniting is when you like light a match and start something on fire. So it's a reference to a metaphor for fire and fighting. Reluctantly, which means he didn't want to do it because he feared igniting war, President Lincoln sent supplies to reinforce Sumter. So he just sent supplies. He didn't want to start fighting. But the Confederates blocked the harbor with orders from President Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy. General Beauregard demanded that the Union surrender the fort. But Major Anderson ignored the ultimatum. I had an ultimatum in my life. I had to take it. The woman was tough. Confederate fire erupted, or erupted like a volcano, boom, exploded. On April 12th, 1861, Anderson had little choice but to surrender. First victory goes to the Confederacy. Abraham Lincoln called on local militia, so didn't have any troops there. So it's like here, he can say, hey, you guys in K-Town, you have to defend LA, so I'm going to make you guys a local militia. He called on the local militia in the Union states to suppress any uprisings against federal territory or laws. In essence, the Civil War had begun, and the Union rallied around its new president. A lesser man or leader might have yielded or given in to the insurrection, but Lincoln upheld what he believed were his duties under the oath of office to protect and defend the constitution and the country. With the powers vested in him to mobilize militia and blockade Confederate ports. Now we're down to our very last part here. Four years at war. So remember that that might be a question. Neither side knew at the initial firing that the civil war would last four years and rank among the bloodiest wars ever fought. So I think they thought it was gonna be like a six month short period of time. Uh, four years a little long. Although the issue of slavery loomed large, which means it was a big issue, it didn't by any means diminish or lessen the goal of reconciling the country. So the more stronger goal was bringing the country back together. Lincoln, to his credit, refused to recognize the legitimacy of the Confederate government, insisting instead that it was a rebellion that need to be quelled or stopped. 
Lincoln's resolve was to the North's advantage, for he became the towering tall symbol in body and in deed of the nation's strength. While the North enjoyed other advantages in terms of population, troops, and resources, the South found it easier to defend its territory than to invade. I think that's a geographical reason. The North had to push forth, carrying the battles south in order to cripple the South's capacity to wage war. Of course, this proved to be most costly and time consuming, AKA four years. Strategically, the South felt it could learn from the example set in the Revolutionary War. To win meant exhausting the other side, making them tired, dragging out the conflict until the North hopefully would no longer want to commit resources uh, to the effort or to the war that they might just give up and say it's too much of a fight, we'll stop and leave the South alone. Early in the Civil War, Lincoln removed Brigadier General Urban McDowell from his command of the Federal Army and placed Major General George B. McClellan in the role. While McClellan restored morale and raised the caliber of the fighting forces, he lacked decisiveness and was very slow. Union soldiers dressed in blue government issued uniforms, whereas the South official color was gray. However, as some clothing worn by Confederate soldiers came from the Union casualties or their own clothing reserves, the dress code varied a bit. Okay, so we have finished this week and this quarter for lectures. Thank you for staying with me. So let me get on to the whiteboard and the last two questions of the quarter. Get that pencil, then what you want to steal it. Give it to Purdue. Okay, again with my one hand. Okay, how did Lincoln respond? Teacher, what are you talking about? We don't understand how, okay, our last question, this is question 12, it's connected to 11. And our last question on the prior page was how did the Civil War start? So it started and then how did Lincoln react to this, okay? It's that simple. Don't try to make an excuse and say, well, I don't know how to answer this. Okay, no tricks and all, all your guys' tricks because I have some tricks on my own. Okay, so the last question of the quarter. Oh, I have to go to the restroom. I might take 20 minutes. Is that okay? Okay, I'll go to the restroom or finish. What do you, no? Okay. All right. Okay, plain and simple, I just read this, so this should be fresh in your mind. What were some of the North's advantages? Again, remember, the more you write, the better. If you only write one, I'll point back to the question and say advantages, okay? So let me mark off that that was the last page. It should be 107 in my book, or not Wani, but uh, Nisha. Mark this off here. If I gave you 13 questions instead of, I usually give you 16. Uh, so again, here we go. How did Lincoln respond to the start of the Civil War? Did he just give up and in the South won? What did he do? And in 13, what were some of the North's advantages? That they had some shinsengumis in the North and the South didn't. 
uh, what were their advantages, right? Or they were, they were the first part of the country to have bulgogi. What was an advantage? Or give me a few. Okay. So that's it. I'm going to go to the eraser. Thank you for staying with me the whole quarter. And hopefully I'll see you the next quarter. Okay. I'll, I'll put at the end where you could my email so you could send me uh, donations. Okay. Thank you. So how did Lincoln respond? Mola. 13, what were the Norse ad man, ad advantages? Morgues saw. Okay, that's it. Goodbye, everybody. I love you all. I'm ending the lesson. Okay, good night.